Hi, Greg Lewis, Metastock Software. Hey, you're about to watch one of the great presentations from our recent online trader summit. I know you're going to enjoy it. If you do not yet have Metastock, make sure you visit metastock.com slash traders dash summit three for one for a great three for one offer for Metastock plus market data. Also, make sure to listen to Jeff Gibby at the end of today's presentation. He has a really great offer. It's very exciting and I know you're gonna uh, wanna hear it. Uh, finally, make sure to leave us some feedback. We always wanna hear your feedback and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much and successful trading. Let's go ahead and uh, get over to Mark Sebastian. Mark is uh, somebody that uh, has done the online trading summit before. He did a really good job. Uh, things that I would talk about with Mark are um, super nice guy. Uh, I remember we went to uh, an event with, and that's probably what I've said about everybody, right? I remember we went uh, to an event that we that he did at the CBOE Options Exchange, one of the best events I've been to. Very. Uh, but Mark's very thorough. Uh, uh, he's really, really going to do a good job. I can feel it. Oh, you can. Uh, <laughs> I can feel it, Mark. That How are you doing, Matt? That makes me happy. Uh, that's my goal is to do a really good job. And, um, you know, uh, I know that you just got done talking about Metastock, uh, some Metastock scans and products. And you and I will get uh, get something working here now that uh, a little time has passed. And I think you guys looking through some stuff, there's some fun stuff we can build together. So, All right. Um, we'll but, take it uh, up on Monday. <laughs> yeah, here we go. I've got well, Monday's not going to be good. So I've got a, uh, a a final four game today that's extremely important to me, and then hopefully I'll have another game on Monday that I'm watching. Um, so we've got some uh, some big stuff here. I don't know how many people are college basketball fans, but uh, I actually watched the ladies' final four yesterday. It was off. I was surprised. I mean. I'm not usually a ladies basketball fan, but uh, the two games were great. Uh, and so I'm hoping we get the same thing today uh, with um, Loyola Chicago and uh, Michigan and uh, Villanova in Kansas. Hopefully we get a Loyola Villanova uh, final. That would be uh, that would be my I would love to see that. So uh, as a Nova guy myself. So uh, uh, you might as well be talking about uh, uh, chemistry. <laughs> to me, but I'm going to let you get going. All right. It's good to see everybody here. It's good to, uh, it's good to, uh, I want to thank Jeff and uh, the Meta, Meta stock for having me. Uh, we're going to talk about weekly option trading. Um, let me first introduce myself. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mark Sebastian. Uh, I am the founder of Option Pit. Um, I also run a, uh, a couple of hedge funds. So um, one that is primarily volatility based and one that is uh, what we, a smarter version of the S&P um, with a hedge over the top. But Option Pit uh, is an education and consulting company. We work with individuals, teaching them how professionals think and trade like myself. Uh, and then we also work with hedge funds and money managers and asset managers uh, on a consultancy basis, helping them do strategy implementation, uh, stress testing, things like that. So, uh, you know, I, I don't consider us an education company. I consider us a company of traders who teach because that's how I learned. When I, uh, when I started trading, um, the, you know, the way I got in, people go, how, do you, how did you get into options? Well, uh, I graduated from Villanova and got hired by a company called Group One. And Group One, um, basically throughout the day, through the trading day, I would clerk. So I'd go grab lunches, fill in data, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, and then after that, I would um, have class for several hours. Then we would have mock trading. So I was basically working from, you know, call it 7.30 in the morning till, you know, till 3.30 as a clerk, 4.30 as a clerk, and then from 4.30 to 6.30, I would have training. Uh, after about a year of training, they finally put me on a badge, and then I was a market maker on the American Stock Exchange, 
and the CBOE for about 10 years. Um, then after I left, I, you know, thought about what I'd done. I, I had returned the favor. I would go and help the, the new kids after work, just like uh, old traders had taught me. And I um, realized that there was nothing like that for uh, the retail work. You know, just a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of bad education. There was nothing that really taught professional thinking and really how to, how to manage risk. And that is why we founded Option Pay. Um, so that is, that is what I do. Um, so now what am I going to teach you guys? We're going to talk about what traders want with options, why weekly options work. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of ways to take advantage of weeklies. And I'm going to show you some best trades, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more, and we can look at some things maybe if we have some time. What do traders want? All right. So, and, th and this is really before you start trading. Uh, and I don't mean like for a day. I mean, if you're a newer trader, you need to think about what do you want. All right. So there's, you know, the what do I want from life goals? And then really, what do I want in a trade? All right. I'm going to skip the life goals piece. I'm going to talk about what do you want as a trader, all right? What do you want as an option trader? The first thing you want is flexibility. Flexibility is key. The ability to do what you want, when you want, where you want it. That is by far the most important part, um, in, in my opinion, of, of trading, having the ability to be flexible and and do what you want and where you want it. The next thing you want is control. All right, control over what you're doing. Um, you know, when I was a market maker, I have flexibility, but I didn't have control. Uh, control. I, I had zero control about what the orders were that were coming at me. So there was a lot of order flow and paper that would flow in and out. And I had zero control over whether someone wanted to sell or buy. Right? I could go and try and do what they did as well. <laughs> but really, um, you know, the ability to have control is key. And that's one thing retailer traders really have is control. And they, they tend not to use it as much as they should. And then the final thing is speed. You want speed. And what do I mean by speed? I mean the trader wants to be in the trade for as little a time as possible. The longer you are in a trade, the more likely it is to lose. That is especially true with options. The longer you hold an option position, the more opportunity that position has to lose. So if you can get into a trade and out of a trade with speed, you are in a position to win. Those are the three things that traders want. I mean, what else, you know, you guys, all right. Is there anything that you think I'm missing? Control, flexibility, and speed. I, I don't think so. You know, I thought about this in some detail. Spent some time on it. Those are what I want. That's the key. All right. So let let's start with flexibility. All right. So when I, when I was a market maker. We didn't even have weekly options. Like weekly options started in like 2011. Um, so think about this. I mean, I'd been on the floor for 10 years and never saw a weekly option. So we had six expirations in equities and maybe 10 in the indexes. All right. Um, we had, um, you know, the three front months usually, all right, you have, you know, so right now we have April and May and that's it. We wouldn't have probably didn't have June. 
all right? And then, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, that was it. And then maybe we had a month, five or six months out. And then maybe we had, um, and then maybe we had um, leaps. And that was it. So really as a trader, well, I'm just trying to formulate it, all right? Um, maybe as a, uh, a trader, Um, we had, so really I didn't have any control at all. Um, I didn't have any flexibility, right? I just had a few contracts that I could trade, right? So if I had an earnings this week, I still only had the April options to trade with. And if I had, um, earnings the week of expiration, well, then I had that, I had that week. Um, you know, if I wanted to trade something that was going to expire, I would, um, you know, if I, I had to wait for, you know, if I wanted something short dated, my only option was April. All right. Then, um, you know, that, that was really it. So let's kind of think about this. All right, let's look at Apple options. All right. I want to pull up, uh, pull up, uh, Apple options here real fast. And I kind of want to talk about, take a look at how many different strikes there are now. I have the ones expiring next Friday, the ones expiring the following Friday, I've got regular April. I mean, they go out for a very long time. Check this out. 27th, May 4th, May 11th, May 18th, June, July, August, October. I mean, there's what? 14 or 15 different contracts I can trade. All right. This month in March, there were 14 expirations in the S&P 500. This last week, there was an expiration on Monday. There was an expiration on Wednesday and on Thursday. If we didn't have Friday off, there would have been an expiration on Friday as well. It's pretty sp spectacular how much there is in terms of flexibility. It's crazy. So that is, the, the ability to now do what you want and when you want to do it is such a powerful tool, and I don't think people take advantage of it. So let's start with, with having so many expirations. They give the trader almost complete control and flexibility in the trade. I can trade before, during, and after an earnings. All right? I can trade before an event, an, an FDA announcement, economic activity. Right? So... We had that the Federal Reserve a couple of weeks back, and I could have traded the morning before and the Friday after in S&P options. And in, and in TLT, I could have traded the Friday before and the Friday after. Um, all kinds of way of trading things. Earnings. You know, at, we're starting to get into earnings season. If I want to play a run up before earnings but don't want to play with earnings, guess what? I can buy the Apple April 27s. If I want to play earnings, I could buy the May 4ths. I mean, I would have died to get that kind of – I would have begged to get that kind of, of uh, exposure. I mean, look at this. So Apple has earnings, and I can trade in front of it or after it. That was just unheard of when I was a, a floor trader. I would have died for that. All right. So the things that weekly options can give the trader that is most valuable, I think, is speed. So you've got that flexibility and control. But now with weeklies, you get speed. 
So there are some mis, mis I would say misunderstandings about um, decay. All right. We all seen that graph where decay just kind of falls off in the final 30 days. How many people think that, you know, that's the way most people interpret decay. So here's the problem is that that decay is only for at the money options. So an at the money option is the only option that really has exponential decay the final few weeks. Um, and the further out I go, the more decay becomes linear. And then it can take forever for an ultra cheap option to die. I mean, absolutely forever. So this is kind of the way I think about it is you get, you know, out of the money options. Look, you, you actually can see that the decay actually starts to flatten up. In the money options tend to have a, you know, just kind of that value, a, a, a more linear decay. And then you can see at the money things just die. So a lot, I think one of the mistakes a lot of people make is they don't take it, that do trade weeklies. There's a lot of people that do trade weeklies that don't trade them right. And the first key is, is they don't trade the erosion properly. Why in the world, right, would you not want to take advantage of the way these, these options erode against each other? All right. So, you know, just looking at Apple options again, or here, uh, even something like GE, pull up GE. All right. What I want you to notice, so looking at the strikes, here's calls, here's puts. All right, so GE, this is the um, April 13th, and I want you to notice something. This 12 and a half put is going to be, is like 13 cents. A week later, it's still worth seven, so it only loses six cents here between in, in what is supposed to be its fastest decay period, the difference between next Friday and the following Friday is six cents. We'll now take a look at, this is regular April, the same 12 and a half. It's worth 22. This may surprise you. So this is 22 and this, and, and then April 13th, 12 and a half puts are worth 13 cents. So how much did it lose between April, uh, between April 13th, between April 13th and April 20th and April 6th and April 13th? The 12 and a half lose six cents. In the near term, but going from regular April to April 13th, there's a nine cent differential. And then going from in here, here's where you'll see how this stuff works. The April 27s are only worth 28 cents. So you lose six cents, you lose nine cents, you lose six cents. So if I was looking to sell the 12 and a half put, what contract should I sell? Should I sell the front week, the next week out, the third week out, or the month, one month out? Thank you, Robin. I appreciate the, the being the grammar police. Right? When, when do I want to sell? Let's, let's pull this up. Do I want to sell this one where I'll make where it's worth seven cents? All right, and it decays between here and here. We lose six. Between here and here, 
we lose nine. And here and here, we lose six. Yeah. Who here, who here thinks, you know, the, the big thing you don't, a lot of people understand, that is that decay is not at its greatest that final week for every option. It is not. You make more money selling the 12 and a half put. All right. You make more money selling the 12 and a half put on the April 20th strike and buying it back a week later than you do selling the April 13th and buying it back a week later or even the April expiring the 6th and letting it expire worthless. You got to and the reason why is that fundamental understanding that decay is only at its peak at the money in that final week and those final weeks. The further out the further we go from at the money, the more decay becomes linear. And there will be points where they actually make more selling a different a different week. All right, so now because of exponential decay, weak options may be the best for put selling strategies, covered call writing, and advanced income strategies, namely butterflies. I will tell you that if you're doing weekly condors, you are doing it wrong. All right, so the best trade I like is, like I said, put covering, Put selling, cover call, which then creates the wheel, which is the best. All right. And advanced income. What is gamma doing at those times? That's what's interesting is that um, your gamma is falling the most that, that week, that where you're picking up the most decay. You, so you actually have less risk that week and you make more. Think about that. I make more and I have less risk. I'll do that. All right, so let's talk about the triple income wheel. And it's the simplest way to use weekly calls and puts in tandem. All right. Um, and it's a really nice little little um, way of not owning stocks, but owning stocks and, and getting into stocks that you'll like. <laughs> So there's three main sources of, in, of income. One, source one, is the first rotation of the wheel. And you start by selling puts. All right? and, and I do this within the, my hedge fund. You start by selling puts. And you follow the secrets to selecting a put to sell. You're saying, Mark, what are the secrets? Does anybody think if there was an actual secret to making lots of money, do you think I would be up here telling you about it? If there was an actual secret. No. You know what I would be doing? I'd be making money hand over fist. All right. So anybody that gets up there and tells you how great whatever system they have on usually is full of it. If it was that great, they'd be doing it. All right. Now, there are smart and well thought out better ways to sell puts. And I've got if you go on YouTube and you look up riding the wheel, I walk through this entire wheel strategy. I'm not going to do that now. But the basic, you want falling volatility and you want a stock that you don't think is going to go down. All right. So then you keep selling that put over and over and over again, building up yield. And you hopefully are selling it at lower and lower strike prices. All right. Then your final hope is that you get put to at the bottom. So you're selling, at, you know, so you've been selling Apple puts for weeks. Apple has its dive last week, and you take delivery. That's what you're hoping for. All right, so now, source two, dividend. You're hoping to collect the dividend. All right, younger traders get a dip, take a drip on that dividend to acquire more shares. 
older employees or employees of the actual company should collect the dividend and invest in the overall market. In fact, if you – one of my rules that I tell people is generally speaking, you should own as little stock in the company you work for as possible. Who knows why? Does anybody has anybody ever heard the term Texas hedge? So a Texas hedge, uh, when I was a floor trader, we you know generally the way we would hedge is we buy calls and sell puts, or we'd buy calls and sell stock, we'd sell calls and buy stock, we'd buy puts and buy stock, we'd sell puts and sell stock. All right, and we'd take out the delta. Well, when I accidentally bought calls and bought stock at the same time. That was called a Texas hedge because you were going big in one direction. All right. So if you work for a company and you've got all your investments in the company, you are Texas hedged. Your livelihood and your retirement is in the same spot. Not a great idea. Own as little of your company as you can. That's my, my personal belief. So now source three, so collect those dividends, and source three is start selling covered calls. And you so, you try and sell at a higher strike. Enron's a great example. And you sell calls at a higher strike than you were put to. All right, so now remember, you've built up a lot of yield. So be aware of what your ownership level is. Right, so if I sold puts, in Apple at the 170 strike, and I collected two bucks a week for 10 weeks, well, then my put to price is really 150. So if I'm selling an Apple 165 call, guess what? I'm happy. Real simple. So let me walk through. This is one I did. For the street.com uh, a few actually this is now a few years uh, about two years ago all right and this is an Oracle but this is one that I, I ran so I do I do some writing for the street.com are you an advocate of selling naked options I am as a way of getting into a stock I am not as a way of producing income so if my goal is to sell puts to own Apple, then I am a proponent. If my goal is to sell puts to create income for, a, for myself, then I am not a proponent of naked selling. All right. And in addition, I, I generally usually still buy a really, really cheap option just so that one, it cleans up my margin and two, if the stock absolutely collapses, and I mean like a uh, a Chipotle, then I have kind of my stop loss. So even when I'm doing these, a lot of times I'll I'll buy like a put for two cents against whatever I sold. Uh, but in this case, let's look at Oracle. I sold September on September 19th. I sold the expiring on the 26th. 39 put and I collected 22 cents. The stock was put to me. So my break even was uh, 38, 38, 78. I then sold the 39 call at 13 cents. That did not, my stock did not get called away. I sold the, on the sixth, I sold the OC 10 call, the OC 10, 39 and a half call at 13, and I collected a dividend. And then on October 13th, I sold the 1839 calls at a quarter. On October 20th, I sold the 39 call at 24 cents. And the stock was called away. So in five weeks, I collected a dollar nine on a $39 stock. <clears throat> That's a 2.7% yield. Annualized, that was almost 30% on Oracle. When was the last time Oracle produced 39% in a year or two years or three years? Had a nice little run recently. I still don't think it did that good. 
you know, what size? I mean, it seems pretty small premium for the rest. It's a $39 stock. If you, you know, I don't think that, I think this is absolutely a fair risk reward. 30% return on 39 bucks, a one lot, $3,900. That's pretty good. Especially if I want to own the stock, right? This is a name that I want to own, which is the key. Yeah. So the you know the idea is that I'm running an income strategy, but I'm getting into the stock. Yes, these were at the money. And, you know, I do, I've, I've run this, I have a little weekly wheel letter that I run and I run this in names all the time. Um, I really like uh, KRE is one I've been doing because I like the mid cap banks. Uh, I, Apple, I ran this in Square. Unfortunately, I got called away. So, yeah. So, anyway, it, it, the, the, what I want you to think, it's, it, it, the stock itself doesn't matter. What I want you to think is that, um, is about using this to get into the names that you want to own, right? We all have names that we like. Square or... Apple or Amazon or General Electric. I, I don't care. All right. Um, what you really want is to use this to get into the names that you want to own. It's a smarter way of getting in. All right, so um, Robert's talking about his commissions. I would say your commissions are ridiculously high relative to what somebody else should be paying. Um, and then I would probably fix that. So commission should never affect, and, and that's actually, I'm glad he brought this up and then I'll move on. Commission, if your commissions are so high as they stop you from doing what you're supposed to do, then you need to find a new broker. I never think about commissions when I trade, ever. All right, so any questions? Um, any other questions about that? What if you and the stock keeps going down? You keep selling stocks. There is a way of, um, you know, we do have strategies to sell call spreads when you're underwater on a stock. Um, I use a couple. So which broker do I use? Um, you know, you, we can take that offline. Um, what uh, what do you do if it keeps going down? Well, what I'll do is I'll sell call spreads instead of calls. And then if the stock really takes off, I get the stock back while I'm producing that income from the call spread. All right. So now. There are traders uh, that we use advanced option strategies at option pit all the time for using weeklies um uh i love using weeklies for calendar spreads and butterflies all right i'm not going to talk about calendar spreads today i am going to talk about butterflies could i discuss the wheel and qqq ask me at the end um so i want to walk through butterflies and i'm going to show you kind of how to think about an iron butterfly an iron butterfly is basically just a straddle that is hatched. Involves the selling of an at the money call spread and an at the money put spread. Uh, at the Sandy, ask me again at the end. The net creates a tightly fined high yield area for the for the spread to profit, and that is an iron butterfly. Real simple. All right, so you've got a range that you want it to, to stay in, but if it goes outside, you're capped. 
let me walk through the characteristics. All right. The long out of the money put will have a higher delta than the out of the money call, and that's caused by skew. All right. So butterflies, when you set them up, typically have a short delta. Now, because the shorts are closer to the money than the longs, I'm producing theta, lots of theta. And remember, I've got those wings that have that less, that more linear decay, and I've got that straddle that has that exponential decay. All right. The spread wants the underlying to stay in a straight, in a tight range. If the short strikes were not equal, that would be an iron condor, correct? Correct. Or, you know, if they're straddling around a, a price, like the first strikes out, and um, the wings are, uh, and the wings are further away, you might call it a split strike butterfly if, if it's still pretty close. Um, what year was that Oracle trade? I do not remember. I don't think it was last year. Um, maybe 2016 or I think maybe or that sound maybe. All right. So the spread is selling premium and thus it's short Vega. So I'm short gamma, short Vega, long theta, short delta. So notice these characteristics. What is going to work? What? What do I need to think about for my weekly butterfly? And the answer is volatility. It's realized and implied. Even in weeklies, implied volatility matters until the last two days. But you're not going to be in this fly for the last two days. That's the beauty. All right, so what do I want with a butterfly? Do I want lots of movement or a little movement? Well, if I'm short gamma... If I want the underlying to stay in a range, I want little movement. And then what kind of skew? And you're saying, what do I mean by skew? Well, remember, I'm buying the wings. So do I want, if I'm buying the wings, and this, this is a skew curve here, folks. We'll look at one. Would I rather the skew curve look like this or like this? What do you think? If I'm buying here and here. Right there. I want that flattish curve. Because these puts, they're really what's going to help me determine the price of my fly. If I pay too much for the puts, I'm probably going to lose. My hedge is what's expensive. So take a look. This is SPX. Do you think this is the that this period is a good time to put on SPX butterflies? What about here? What do you think's better for for butterflies? One or two? Yeah, two for sure. Two for sure. Yeah, in fact, in the last few weeks, I've actually flipped it around and I've been doing buying. I've been buying the the meat and selling the wings on butterflies. And I think I've won 14 of my last 15 or 13 of my last 14. I don't, I don't know off the I got to recount, but it's been hard to lose buying the straddle and selling the wings. Here's another look at Vol. This is some cool stuff that they've got in Metastock. If you're into if you're into kind of tracking volatility, you know, you can kind of see how big of an outlier we're in right now. All right, look at the mean. And then look at where one month, two month, three months is. Yes, it is off icon. Yeah. 
All right. So what you really want is falling realized volatility, high but falling implied, and then skew that is generally flat, not steep. This is skew. There's a couple ways of looking at skew. Skew is super steep right now. Butterflies have not been that great of a trade. They were all the way through the middle of January. And eventually they will start being good again. The one area where you maybe can get away with flies is in weeklies in, a, in some very specific names. All right, so butterflies are the best way to harvest premium out of a weekly trade without taking a directional opinion. All right. The crazy thing is how short of a period of time it is to, to take advantage of a butterfly. All right. Pigs get slaughtered. Smart little piggies go to the market and buy roast beef. So here here's the way I like to tell this story. When I was 14, I, I'm still not that big. I'm only I'm almost five, nine. Right. I'm not a big dude. But uh, my dad was actually in the Green Berets. And when I was 14 years old, he sits me aside because I was getting kind of bullied a little bit. And he said, Mark. If you ever, he's like, I don't want you to fight. I never want you to fight. But if you ever truly feel you're in danger of being hurt, here's what you're going to do. All right. And you know what he told me to do? All right. He said, punch him in the crotch as hard as you can and then run as fast as you can. <laughs> that was his advice. Take one shot and then run. About the only way you're going to get out of it. Thankfully, I never had to do that, but that is the that I still hold, hang on to that advice. And butterflies are the same way. You've got to get in and out. You got to get in and out. All right, so what I want to do is show you. This isn't a very old chart, but it's perfect. I really want to show you how this works. And this is a split strike fly. So the thorax, the center of a butterfly, right here and right here. And the wings are right here and right here. So on a Monday, if I execute this trade, Selling the thorax, I collect $1.84, and I pay $0.61 cents for the wings. That is a net credit of $1.23. So then um, the next day, that Tuesday, take a look. Here's my wings. Thorax, thorax, wing. All right, so now my, my thorax is $1.50, so it lost $0.34, cents, and my wings are $0.45. Cents. So it went from $1.23 to $1.05 in a day. That's uh, $0.18. Cents. So what is $0.18 cents over a buck twenty-three a risk? Yeah. So it, I made 18 cents. So what's 18 divided by 123? Mm hmm. 14 percent overnight. Almost 15 percent. Commission maybe brings it down to 12. If you make 12 percent in a day, what do you think? Should you stay in your trade or should you be greedy? Oh, excuse me. The margin on that fly was, I'm sorry, I collected $1.23. The margin on the fly was 77 bucks. It's even better, right? It's two bucks wide. Duh. So 77 bucks a margin and I made 18 bucks a spread. That's actually 
So at 10 lot, my margin would be $770, and I'd have made 180 bucks. That's 23% in one day. If you make 23% in one day and you don't take your money, you are a jerk. Let me be clear. You're a jerk. Now, I know annualizing it, this is super stupid. You would never annualize a trade like that. But if you were able to do that every day, you'd make 45000 bucks on $770 risk, run daily. You would never do that well. That's unrealistic. But the point is, if you think about how much that is on your risk, it's silly to keep on the trade. And obviously, it's not that easy. The vol premium moves around. The trade doesn't always work that well. Like I said, weeklies are like punching a guy, punching the bully. Hit him once, right in the crotch, and run as fat and run like hell. Pick your spots and get out. Because let me show you what happens. Two days later, my wings are worth 48 cents. And my thorax is worth a buck eighty-eight, so it's now worth a buck forty. And so instead of making eighteen bucks, I lost twenty-seven, or no, I lost seventeen. Excuse me. So I took a nice winner and turned it into a big loser. That's how you become a jerk. So. When picking a butterfly in a weekly trade, the key is to think about the next two days. All right. What is going to happen between now and then? I don't care what you look at. Right. Use all the, the great meta stock, meta stock tools that they have. And come up with a two day outlook. And if you are in a trade for two days in weeklies. In a weekly butterfly, if I put it on a Monday and I've not made money by Wednesday, I'm in a bad trade. I should get out. I'm in a bad trade. I should get out. All right. So in summary, weeklies provide everything traders want. Learn how to use the wheel. Understand flies. And again, there's a lot more they can do. Um, April 7th, so a week from uh, today, right, um, we're going to be doing uh, a Mastering Weekly Options course. It's going to be at least four hours, uh, myself and two other educators, and we're going to cover everything you need to know about weeklies in, in terms of actually trading them. Uh, we're going to talk about flies, condors, calendars. Uh, directional strategies, uh, some really good risk management stuff. Uh, and you go to optionpit.com slash weeklies. In our store, it's going to be $300. Uh, it's going to be $147 between now and then. All right. Is it okay to sell straddle or to buy straddle depending on volatility level? I, I definitely do use that stuff. Thank you very much, Robert. I appreciate that. Sorry, I got a little, uh, little slow on the front end. I was there was a little distraction in the other room. Uh, I because I'm at my in-laws and uh, my my son is obsessed with presidents. So, um, so it's going to be a great class. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, we spent we literally spent yesterday. We spent an hour picking out the 10 worst and 10 best presidents and then compared notes. We both agree that James Buchanan was the worst. Um, so we're, this is going to be a great class. You're going to, if you've learned a lot here, um, you're going to learn a ton. We're going to give, give you a bunch of actionable ideas. Um, I'm going to go through my calendar strategies. I'm going to show you how to buy flies and manage that type of stuff. Uh, 147 bucks. When after the class, it will immediately be 300. Um, and if you sign up between now and Monday, I have a daily options class that I have in the tank where I covered how to literally trade a single day. 
And I'll include that uh, if you sign up by uh, Monday. So go to optionpit.com slash weeklies. Any other, any questions? Any questions? I know we had some. Someone was asking about using the wheel on the QQQs. Um, I think that, that if, if you're interested in using the, the triple Qs as a long-term investment, I think that would totally make sense. Um, I use the wheel on SPX in my hedge fund. That is one of the, the one of the components of our hedge fund is trading the wheel. We then have a an actual hedge over the top of it, thus it's actually a hedge fund. So uh, I'm not sure if I saw any other questions, but uh, thank yeah. you very much for uh, so buying where buying where selling where um, I, it's not that easy, Bogdan. I, it also depends on SKU. What broker does a retail trader use as to not pay through the notes? Uh, there's a long list of brokers. Brokers is getting less and less expensive. Basically, if you snoop around and you don't put your money with somebody that pays for TV ads, you will save yourself a lot on Commission, and um, I believe Meta stock themselves does options trading, and I believe it's entirely reasonable. Their we don't do any trading. <laughs> well, then that's even better. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Mark. We really appreciate your time today, and go yeah. ground that kid. Yes, email me. Yes, Pamela, email me. You're good. Oh, okay. I told you to send me. Well, oh, never mind. There um, was a question. Tazzy asked if you're recording the session in case people can't make it live. I did record it. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. there you go. Um, and um, people at so the brokers I use are TradeHawk, LiveVolX, TD Ameritrade, and um, those are the three main brokers I use. Although there are other brokers that are perfectly fine. Um, yeah, and the event on the 7th is recorded, and you'll get a copy plus all the materials. All right. Thank you, Mark. Right. Appreciate it. Yep, thanks again.